<laughs> well, good morning. Well, good morning. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> good morning. So this is your cue. So this to is your cue your to find your seat and uh, and uh, <coughs> be ready for our worship be ready time. For Thank our you worship for coming. And Thank you for coming and worshiping, with us, and worshiping with us on Easter this Sunday morning. Easter Sunday our morning. Traditional our traditional greeting is for greeting me to say is he is for me risen. To say he is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen. 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 So this morning, so this morning, uh, got up and I uh, got and up and I went and to the living room and opened our, and opened our curtains the road and across the road and our neighbor's lawn. And our neighbor's lawn and I saw, I saw a bunny rabbit. A bunny rabbit. And this bunny rabbit this was no spring chicken. This bunny rabbit chicken. was no spring this, chicken. This one, is, <coughs> this one, is <laughs> full size. This full size. Had a good winter. Had a good winter. This bunny rabbit. This bunny rabbit. And, uh, and, and I just uh, scurried about. I just scurried about. Was eating off the lawn and then the lawn and then went away. Went away. I thought that's pretty cool. Easter Sunday morning. Easter Sunday morning. I got to see an Easter. But now I cannot, Easter, now I cannot deny, confirm or actual deny it's Easter bunny. actual Easter bunny. But I saw, but I saw, I, thought, I, thought, I, got, I, thought, I got, got an Easter bunny got story, story from bunny church, this morning. Morning. church this morning. And then I find out Pastor, then I find Holly, out and Pastor Rob, Holly and Rob, their bunny had their little bunny baby had little bunnies, bunnies and they found them just, they this, found morning, them just so. this morning. So yeah, yeah. One upsmanship One up in the staff of Easter bunny stories. That's what's going on here. That's what's going on here. That's going to come up in staff meeting next time. Easter greetings this Easter morning greetings to, those this morning are, to uh, those who are uh, in with us worshiping in with us YouTube. by YouTube. So, uh, we've, so got uh, we've got friends in the church who are traveling right now and, right watching, now in that and way. So, uh, watching in that uh, way. So uh, we miss you. Uh, uh, we miss you. Safe travels. Uh, safe travels. Uh, I also know that there's people, uh, know that there's people who are spending time with family, spending this, time with weekend, family this weekend. And, uh, there are and uh, many others. Many others who are ill and a little bit under the weather. And they're just staying away. So God bless you all. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for joining uh, in online by, uh, online by, our, by, live stream. by our live stream. Um, only um, one, only one really to share with really you. To share with there's, you. There's, a, there's, a, there's a Thursday morning, Thursday morning going to be happening, be happening starting, on starting on April 28th, Thursday, April 28th, April 28th, April 28th 10 a.m. 10 a.m. And uh, Roger and, uh, is going Roger to be leading that. To be leading and, that. Uh, he's, and he's, he's leading the study out of the study out of Jim Symbala. Jim Symbala. When God's when God's spirit. Moves. And, uh, and uh, Jim is the Jim pastor, is of, the Brooklyn pastor Tabernacle. of Brooklyn Tabernacle. Uh, and uh, and uh, I remember watching, I remember a, sermon watching a sermon back of in the his 19, back in the 1980s. And uh, he was a, and, uh, he was uh, a young pastor uh, at that time. At that time. Uh, and he did this. Uh, and he did sermon this on prayer. You sermon find on it online. You on find YouTube. it online on YouTube. Uh, it, it uh, just it really, just, uh, quite, really uh, quite, quite brilliant, quite and brilliant, insightful, and insightful, and, uh, spirit and, filled, uh, spirit filled. And so I think this so will be a great study for anybody. Great study for anybody to participate. To participate. You need a study guide. You need a study to guide to along. help you along. And there's a sign-up sheet. And there's a sign-up sheet to let to let Susan know that you're going to that you're going to joining because she will be the one that orders the study guides. If you want one, if you want one, she wants to order them. She wants to order them today, today, so, that order them so, today here, so that they're here by the beginning of the study on the twenty eighth. And it's and it's six weeks. Am I remembering right? Am I remembering right? It's going to be for six. It's going to be for consecutive weeks. Consecutive weeks starting April twenty eighth. Starting April twenty Eight. Uh, this morning we uh, have this morning we have Pastor uh, Holly and Pastor the worship Holly team going to be bringing us, us, gonna be bringing uh, us worship in uh, song. Worship in song. We've got Amelia who's going to be sharing a testimony, of, sharing a testimony one of her favorite songs. One of her favorite this morning. songs. We've been doing that through the whole season of Lent, the forty of Lent days preceding Easter, days preceding Easter. And and Sunday by and Sunday, Sunday by Sunday, about different songs that have been impactful to us, congregation members, congregation members, ones have shared through the ones have shared through the Amelia is going to share. Amelia is going to share this morning. Very grateful, grateful for that. Very grateful and for we that. have on we have on screen, screen, screen corner for time, kids corner time, an old friend making an, old an appearance, making again, an appearance so. again. So let it. <laughs> You're already guessing who. All right. Let me pray, and we will continue on with uh, worship and song. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this day, the remembrance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On Friday, we commemorated. Uh, his death on the cross and uh, the significance and impact that has for us and for indeed the whole world. But Lord, on the third day, Jesus rose from the grave and what an amazing thing that is. How unique in all of the world, 
how unique among all human civilization that God would come into our world and sacrifice himself and then reveal his great power. Because if he has power over even death, then he does indeed have power over sin in our lives. Thank you for this story and this testimony. Be with us today as we reflect and as we celebrate the story of Easter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand and we want to celebrate our resurrected Lord and Savior this morning. So let's begin by singing together, My Redeemer Lives.
You may be seated. Pastor Daniel already alluded to the fact you are going to have a old friend on screen. Well, my friend Sam got word that we have been talking about hymns. And he was a little put out by the fact that a certain one in particular has been overlooked. So Sam has taken matters into his own hands, and you will see what has ensued. Do you want to start us off, Sam? Hi, guys! It's me, Sam Puppet Sam, and I'm here with my friend Betty and Pastor Holly. Sam was a little upset this week because he heard that we've been doing some hymns. And Sam, what was your issue? No, one person asked me about my favorite hymn. And you should all know it by now. We have not covered Sam's favorite hymn, and it's Easter Sunday. And so, so you know what that means, guys? Up from the grave of wells. <laughs> all right, so just for Sam, and Betty's been a good sport, Nobody else but Betty can play for Sam. I'm really nervous playing with the best. Thanks for coming and playing for me, Betty. Oh, you're very welcome. How did you do that? I'm a little nervous, so take it well, easy don't on me, okay? Nervous. Just relax. But do you need to do a few vocal warm ups, Sam? Yep. Give me a C, Betty. That's right, she's starting to get he's starting to get a little bit more in tune. We'll work on it, Betty. We're working on it. Alright, you ready, Sam? I'm ready. Are All you right. ready, Betty? Yep. It's okay. number 216 in the hymn book. Christ arose. Pickle those ivories, Betty. <laughs> We don't let them think that. Thanks for playing, Betty. Oh, you're very welcome. You nailed it. <laughs> Happy to do that for you. It's not every day you get to play with the infamous sock puppet Sam, is it, Betty? No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Bye for now. <laughs> Bye, guys. See you. <laughs> Jesus Loves Me. A little history. It was written in 1859 by Anna B. Warner. The first part of this song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know, For the Bible Tells Me So, first showed up in her sister, Susan Warner's book, called Say and Seal. In a part of the story, a little boy was dying, and there was nothing the doctor could do. During his final, final moments of life, the novel's main character, Mr. Linden attempted cons to console him. Mr. Linden recites the poem that began, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Moving the Warner's readers to tears, 
He succeeds in comforting the dying boy and eases his burden till his, until his death. This hymn means a lot to me because it was the first hymn that I sang as a kid. Because my mom sang it to Ethan and I always before bed. As a teen in a public school, I'm surrounded with non-Christian people and it is easy to stick with the crowds than stand out. But out of school, I surround myself with Christian people and go to youth groups to surround myself with people of my age with the same beliefs. That helps me strengthen my faith. It also reminds me that Jesus will always love me and watch over me. As a kid, I didn't know what that song meant, but now that I'm older, I have a better understanding of what Jesus' love means to me. Thank you, Amelia. Well said, and thank you to each person that has shared their testimony of a hymn with special meaning to them over these last several weeks. And so, what a better reminder on Easter Sunday of Jesus' love for us. And we're going to stand together and we're going to sing, Jesus Loves Me.
thank you that you have risen. And we look forward to that glorious day when one day we can be forever in your presence. Thank you for that hope and for that promise. We just thank you for your presence here this morning and with us each and every day. And we just ask these things in your name. Amen. Please be seated. living again. Uh, at this time, the kids are dismissed. This is ages three to about grade six. Uh, there's uh, Sunday school downstairs for the kids, and so they can, they can go down for that. I'm going to begin this morning by reading Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. So if you have a Bible with you, hope you do. I uh, always encourage you to have a Bible with you at church. If not, there's one in your pew that you can, uh, that you can look along with. I've just got the one verse up, because that's really kind of the, the highlight thought here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the, 
prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. By what? By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Lord God, as we reflect on the scriptures uh, this Easter Sunday morning, and we think about grace and the law, we ask that uh, you would open our minds and our hearts to receive from you. Teach us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. To understand grace, you really first have to understand uh, the law. And as I was reflecting on law and humanity's relationship with the law and thinking about the different dynamics of that, um, Lisa told me a story about her dad, my father-in-law. Delbert was his name. He uh, passed away too soon. Um, But he he was a great man. You all would would have loved him. Uh, Delbert, I mean, well, there was a law that that he broke uh, a few times. So he had in his possession a pocket knife, and he had the pocket knife for a long time. It wasn't a family heirloom or anything, but he had this pocket knife that he'd use for typical pocket knife stuff, Uh, opening packages, cutting off a thread off the, you know, whittling, whatever, right? just used a pocket knife all the time. Um, Has anyone been in a lineup like like this before? You know what lineup this is? Airport security. What's the relationship between airport security and pocket knives? (laughs) So, So poor Delbert... He goes to the airport. Living in Thunder Bay, it's not a big airport. Living in Thunder Bay, uh, traveled around, come visit our family uh, uh, out west from time to time. He'd go to the airport and wouldn't even be thinking of the law, the rule. And the rule is no knives on the airplane. (laughs) Actually, a pretty reasonable rule, really. No knives on the airplane. And so he'd go through the security line and what would they discover? Discovered his knife. And what happened? Gone. So this knife that he had with him for all these years, again, not a family heirloom per se, gone. And he took his trip. Next time he had to take a trip, went to the airport, and the same knife got confiscated from him again. What? Wait a minute. How'd that happen? Next trip. Same knife got confiscated from him again. Next trip, same knife got confiscated. Why? How, how did this occur? Well, in my father-in-law's church was a friend named Ralph. Ralph worked at the airport. <laughs> Ralph worked at airport security. And so when the knife was confiscated from my father-in-law, who now had it? Ralph had it, and what did Ralph do with said confiscated knife? Gave it back to Delbert. And Delbert, knowing there's not really any consequences to bringing your knife to the airport because you're just going to get it back anyway, kept breaking the same rule over and over and over, right? Interesting. Humanity's relationship with rules. 
uh, consequences for rules are more or less severe depending on which ones you break. Confiscation of something may happen and Ralph might not give it back to you. You might not get it back, so the thing that you broke the law with might be confiscated and gone. Jail time is a very real possibility if you've broken a rule. Or uh, maybe it's a, a really small rule that you get away with if nobody noticed. Um, limit two per customer. Well, if you take three and sneak it past the cashier, well, you got three instead of two. You broke the rule and got away with it, right? We take rules more or less seriously, it seems, depending on the authority they came from and the consequences there are for breaking them. It's the Apostle Paul who wrote these words in Ephesians about grace. And what's interesting is, though he wrote extensively about grace and really unpacked that theology for all of humanity, uh, he had a pretty tight relationship with the law, God's law. He took it really very seriously. So what about God's law? The Apostle Paul was a follower of God's law. This is what it says in his words. He wrote these words in the book of Philippians in the Bible, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. He's, he's comparing himself with everybody else who was supposedly of the people of God, supposedly the ones who would obey God's laws. He said this of himself. He says, I am of the people of Israel, I am of the tribe of Benjamin, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. Any idea what a Pharisee is? Uh, Old Testament days. A, a, a Pharisee is one who looked at the condition of the nation of Israel, and they were under occupation at the time, uh, geopolitically. The occupier for Israel back in the day, was Rome. And so the Pharisees are the ones who were of the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, and they were saying, how is it possible that God would allow Rome to have invaded us and be over us? It must be our own fault. If we obey God's laws, then he will bless us, he will get rid of this uh, oppressor, and we will be free to be his pe people and uh, rule the land ourselves. The Pharisees were the group that not only liked to make sure everybody was following the law so that God's blessing would come upon the people, but in fact they made extra rules that were a little more strict so that if you obeyed these rules, you certainly wouldn't be breaking God's laws. of the Pharisees was Paul. Verse 6, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless is the word he uses of himself. Uh, no haughtiness there either. He's teaching. He's teaching them something. Of the people of Israel, and I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, and I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Well, that's quite a claim. He knew the law. You, you know the Ten Commandments? Well, that's just the, the tip of the sword for the law of God of the Old Testament. 613 different commands there are. And Paul knew all the Pharisaical laws too, and, and it kept those. And the law, the law is inflexible. The law of the Old Testament is inflexible. Here is the law. If you break it, there's consequences. If you keep it, there are blessings. But it's inflexible. It is a straight line. You've broken it or you've kept it. There's no middle ground. There's no gray area. And the law is pretty harsh. The law of God is harsh. If you look back in the Old Testament, there's a, there's a, in terms of consequences for breaking the law, eye for an eye is part of the consequences. That's written into the Old Testament part of the Bible. Leviticus chapter 24, verses 19 to 20 says, If anyone injures his neighbor 
As he has done, so shall it be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person, it shall be given back to him. Now that sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? There's actually mercy built into that law. Because if somebody causes another person harm, what's the victim's reaction? What do they want to see happen? Justice or revenge? <laughs> Which do they want? Oh, well, I just want justice. Oh, yeah, really? You don't want to see even worse happen to the person? It, it, it was a, a mediating effect on punishment. Eye for an eye, not two eyes for one eye. Yet still, uh, really quite allowed for uh, consequences to happen. If the law is broken, if you have harmed another, then harm can and shall come to you. Another consequence of breaking the law in the Old Testament was banishment. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 8. Everyone who eats this shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned what is holy to the Lord and that person shall be cut off from his people. There were, there were food laws in the Old Testament. Things you were supposed to eat, things you were not supposed to eat. And that had to do with setting God's people apart from the other nations of the world because God's people were set apart. That's part of the definition of the word holiness. God is holy, therefore his people will be holy. They will be set apart from everyone else. And the food laws were all wrapped up in that. And if somebody disobeyed the food laws, then they weren't keeping the holiness of the community. And if they weren't keeping the holiness of the community, what was the result? Banishment. The words on the screen. Banishment. Gone. Then there's another consequence for the breaking of God's law. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Blasphemy, what's that? Blasphemy. Taking the Lord's name in vain misusing it, cursing it, okay? calling oneself equal to God. These things are all in the category of blasphemy. And the Old Testament laws have a very strict line on that. Blasphemy, the consequence is death. The, the community of God's people cannot tolerate that being a part of them. And when you look through the Old Testament, when you look through... Uh, the law, these are the results for breaking them. This kind of stuff. And the Old Testament reads very harsh because of all that. The law is not to be trifled with. Remember the story of uh, Uzzah? Remember that name out of the Old Testament? They're carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. And it wobbles as things do when they're carried on poles, and it starts to tip over. And what's he do? <laughs> he reaches out to steady it. Seems reasonable, but what's the law? Yeah, unless you're of the appropriate people, you're not to touch the ark. In fact, that's what the poles are for, so nobody has to touch it. And he touched it. He broke the law. But I was just, it doesn't matter. He broke the law. And on the spot, he died. So someone who is part of that Hebrew people of God, they're going to take God's law very seriously. And of all the people who take God's law seriously, it's the Pharisees who took it really seriously and tried to get everybody else to take it seriously. And of all the Pharisees who took the law seriously, the Apostle Paul was the one who took it extra serious. That's who this guy is, right? So Paul was obedient to the law. 
But what we find, even by the Apostle Paul's own words, is that the law of God is not very good at motivating people to do the right things. Okay? The law of God has this odd response by sinful humanity where uh, when we are alerted to a wrong thing, suddenly we want to do it. You tell a child, don't touch the hot stove. And what does that do? Well, obviously, all the little obedient children never touch the hot stove. That's what happens, right? No, Pastor Daniel, you haven't met very many little children. That's the kid version of what's going on here, right? When they're told not to do something, it stirs up a curiosity about, oh, what is it like to do that? Don't touch the hot stove. Huh, wonder what happens when you touch the hot stove. Well, you might get burnt. Huh, I wonder what that means, you get burnt. wonder if I should touch the hot stove. The Apostle Paul says it like this. And remember, this is a guy who knows the Old Testament laws of God and keeps them and has bragging rights about how well and how strictly he keeps them. And this is what he says about the law. I, I tried to use as big a font as I could. <laughs> Those who have eyes to see, would you read along with me uh, this passage here? Romans 7, 7, 8. Let's read it. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. Here's what the Apostle Paul, a follower, strict follower of the law of God, found. That knowing the law and knowing more of the law, that awareness then breeds a curiosity to do the things that are against the law. The point he's making is, it's not the fault of God's law. Well, God, if you didn't want us to do that, you shouldn't have told us not to do it. Because now that we know we shouldn't, we will. It's not God's fault. Who does Paul blame here? Sin in us. It is sin that takes the law and twists it to give us desire to break it. Right? Now, it's not that every person will want to break every law that they come across. That doesn't happen. Obviously, that doesn't happen. But every person will break some law, and some of the laws. And it's really interesting that when he's giving an example, uh, he picks covetousness. That's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Because it would be really hard for anybody in a convincing way to say, oh yeah, well, I've never coveted. I've never been envious, right? So he picks on that one. So, knowing this and understanding the law, he throws himself into it, and so he studies and he meditates. He spends time with others who study and meditate on the law. He memorizes great portions of the law. That would be some of Paul's background. So that he could say with some exaggeration, of course, what we read earlier in Philippians, of the people of Israel, and I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, I'm a Pharisee, and as to zeal, I'm a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, I am blameless. Because he's put himself to the discipline of the law. The problem is, Paul, until later, forgot that grace was built in already. Grace existed. 
Paul learned grace. Uh, but it was there already in the Old Testament. If we look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 to 6. This is a prophet of the Old Testament telling what is to come in the fulfillment of God's grace in the world. God was already gracious, but he's telling God's plan of what will come. Isaiah 53, 5-6, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. What does that mean? We have all gone astray. Sin. We've all broken the law of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The eye for an eye, the tooth for a tooth, the banishment, the, re- the necessity of death as a consequence. All that is now instead laid on him. Why? Because God's grace. Because God's grace. How did Paul understand God's grace? Well, he understood God's grace by trying to hold and enact the law and its consequences. The reason Jesus was put on the cross was for the crime of blasphemy. That's what the religious leaders, that's why they put them before the political leaders. The religious leaders took him to the political leaders of Rome, Pilate, and said, "Uh, put this man to death, please, for us. Why? Why? Well, because he has blasphemed against our God. Why? How did he blaspheme? Well, he he made himself equal to God. Well, I don't see any fault with him, but if you want that to happen, then that's what we'll do. And so Jesus went to the cross, and then he was resurrected, and then um, his followers kept on with the message. And the Apostle Paul was one of those ones who wanted that message squashed, wanted this Jesus fellow, his story to just disappear into history and not be remembered any longer. And that's why he is called a persecutor of the church because he he went around and he, he put people under arrest who were following this Jesus and his story. And one day... While he was actually on the job of doing that, he was on the highway uh, walking up to a city called Damascus. And on the road, what happened? Well, he was encountered by Christ, right? He was encountered by Christ. He saw a vision. He heard, he heard a voice. Saul, Saul, that was his name before. Why are you persecuting me? And the Apostle Paul, who was so involved in the law that he would persecute the ones who would follow Jesus, became that day, he had his eyes open. He became awake to the truth of Christ. He began to understand grace and how relationship with God wasn't based on the law and rules. It was based on a relationship with Christ, and an understanding that his death and resurrection was sufficient for our sin to be forgiven and for us to be in right relationship with him. And that's what the Apostle Paul began to understand. He began to understand that he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed, and all we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Apostle Paul's testimony is one of, I knew the law, but then I understood grace. And when I understood grace, that made all the difference. There's a song in our hymn book 
That is uh, one of my favorites. In the United Kingdom, it was voted the eighth most popular hymn of all time. It's number 203. Pull out your hymn book with me. Uh, it's called And Can It Be? Written in 1738. So it's a, it's a couple of years old. Written by Charles Wesley, who wrote 6,000 hymns or something. I mean, the, the guy was just a flood of songs. This was written by him as a, uh, an explanation, a testimony of his conversion to Christ. From one who was a sinner. From one whose eyes were not open. From one who was struggling under the law. From one who lived a whole different life. What it meant that Christ came into his life. Let me highlight some of the words. And can it be that I should gain? And can it be? This is a, these are words of reflection and personal reflection. An interest in the Savior's blood. Died he for me who caused his pain. Was Charles Wesley the only one that Jesus died for? No. Was Charles Wesley the only one whose sins caused pain to Christ? No. But it's interesting how he personalizes it in, these, in this song, right? He personalizes uh, the broad theology and makes it his own. Died he for me who caused his pain. For me who him to death pursued. It's amazing love. And so how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. There's a humility in these words, right? There's a humility that God, who is creator of the world, God, who is omniscient and all-powerful, that he would take notice of the me, the individual I, because what have I got to offer God? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I've met some people who think God could learn a thing or two from them. But if we think about it, what does a holy God have to learn from me? What does a holy God get out of a relationship with me? Who am I that he should pay attention to? to me at all, never mind allow his son to go to the cross on my behalf. Verse 2, he, Jesus, left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace. What's it mean that Jesus left freely? It was of his own choice. Jesus went to the cross freely. He didn't have to. It was necessary for our salvation, but it wasn't necessary for him. He gave himself up, right? Emptied himself, reading on in verse 2, emptied himself of all but love. He set aside his power. He set aside his rights. His rights that the Son of God should not be treated, mistreated by uh, created humanity, Right? He set aside and laid aside that right and allowed himself uh, to be a sacrifice for us. So he emptied himself of all but love. Love was the driving force and motivator. And he bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all, immense and free. For oh my God, it found out me. The love of God even touched and reached out to me. Look at these next words. They're so poignant, visual. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and in nature's night. 
But thine eye diffused a quickening ray, and I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. Well, what was the darkness? What was the light? It was the same as the Apostle Paul lived under the law, was, was obedient to the law, thought he was doing God's will in obedience to the law and carrying out and, and meeting out the consequences and the justice of the law, but he had missed the point of grace. And that's the testament, testimony that Charles Wesley is saying here. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray, and I woke, and the dungeon was flamed with light. What I misunderstood, I now understand. What I did not see before, I now see. The grace that I did not have a grasp on, I now do have a grasp on. And so my chains fell off, and my heart was free, and so I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Interesting. Now that grace is at work, he wants to follow and obey. The law demanded obedience but could not be obeyed. But the grace of God at work in us invites us to obedience that we want to do. And so verse 4, No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in Him is mine. Alive in Him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. So bold I approach the eternal throne. And claim the crown through Christ my own. And this is a testament to Easter Sunday. The resurrection of Christ. His impact in our lives. Not for future heaven and eternal life. Although that's promised here for sure. But even in the day to day. Every day. Followership and obedience to Christ. He makes it all possible because he took notice of us and gave us his grace. Amen? Amen. I'm going to have the worship team come on up and they're going to lead us in singing uh, this great hymn, And Can It Be? So please let us do that while standing. I see you're already standing, so let's sing it together. And can it be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? That he Amazing. 
He is risen. He is risen indeed. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us on Easter Sunday. God bless you. Amen.